most of my work now involves itself within the prison and around uh, the justice, uh, criminal justice area. <coughs> but uh, my opening gambit here in this country was uh, volunteering and also the setting up of Belfast Community Circus. Um, that's been running and is still running now for about 27 years and I'm very proud of the fact that it's about 49 people who are employed by that organisation. But uh, an interesting thing about it was that it was set up uh, by myself and a, a friend of mine, Bill McHenry, uh, in, in order to try and set a sort of a normalisation process for young people in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, it's something that I, I sort of found instructive when I came to Northern Ireland, that I saw this, <coughs> sort of set this up. And uh, it, it's really quite amazing that uh, then later on, around about uh, 1992, um, uh, Circuit Slave, it was a huge organisation, a circus organisation, it's got tentacles all over the world, and uh, they rang us up to sort of say that uh, um, they wanted to set up a circus school in Sarajevo, or actually, they were run up by uh, the Belgian government, uh, an NGO, a non-government organisation in Belgium, uh, to sort of say, we'd like to set up a circus school in Sarajevo. Uh, would would uh, Circus Soleil uh, from Canada be interested in that because they were about to set up a base in Amsterdam? And they said, no, uh, listen, the best people for that would be Belfast Community Circus. They are uh, the specialists in frontier circus. You never heard that before, so it's pretty cool. Isn't it? And uh, basically, what we did was was working in um, peace lines and uh, in communities and bringing them together for circus. And it's a great metaphor, really, if you think about it. And certainly, my growing up as an old fellow in the outback of New South Wales and, and, and Queensland, circuses brought communities together. We travelled miles and miles to, to, to see them. And here, uh, communities that were just uh, across the road were being brought together. So there's my background in, in sort of bringing together of communities here and, and understanding a little bit of the situation. But uh, in, in response to, to one of the things that Cynthia said and, and the speakers this morning have been quite moving and, and quite thought-provoking, in response to the one that no one really talked about with Cynthia asked the question, um, was the fact that I think right throughout the entire work that I've been doing, um, Arts has been a tool in this work. I have never necessarily been interested in the, the <coughs> final product, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through the, the, the proper of my speaking. But uh, I think art is the tool, and whether it be as I started out in, in physical performance and, and circus and clown, um, certainly drama was involved in that, and drama has been a mainstay of the work I've been doing, and that is a, the most powerful of tools. And, and uh, you can take it on further to the, the theatre process where it is, it is witnessed and it is seen and it's for a purpose. But uh, the actual <coughs> process of doing is quite important, and especially now in the, uh, in, the, in the work that I do at the moment, which is, uh, concerns itself in, the, in, in the, uh, the criminal justice system at this point. Um, so in order to give a, this local perspective, um, I, I just wanted to go through drama in the prison context and that's the basis of what I'm going to be talking about here today, because I think it's quite rich with um, our background here in Northern Ireland. Uh, when I first started out working in um, the, the justice system, I, I was uh, elected as an independent representative for young people in care, one of the first two in Northern Ireland. And up until this point, if you consider it, you know, from um, late uh, 70s, early 80s, and I came here in 81, just at the hunger strikes, um, there was a lot of young people who were being asked by adults to do things that were better than cops and robbers in any other city, in any other town, any other world, place in the world. You know, like take that car, put it in that barrow car, set fire to it, steal that, do that. All sanctioned by adults. And the uh, uh, children in secure care and care homes, absolutely, it's through the roof, staggering. I mean, I first uh, set up a, a circus in a, in a care home on uh, St. Pat's on, uh, in West Belfast. And at that stage, there was about 360 kids doing uh, sort of like uh, orders, one to three you know, months you know, orders by the courts for rioting and riders' behaviour and things like this. 
It was absolutely incredible. I was, I was amazed by the size of it all. And so I worked, did a lot of work in the, the first two years in that area, and that put me back into the criminal justice system uh, and, and working through. But circus was the tool, and it's a very important tool. Uh, but then uh, drama, arts, is what is being used at the moment. So that's a little bit of background. I'll just go through to the first slide there, please. Oh, that's the, about the fourth slide. Go back a little bit. Uh, a little bit further back, please. Yeah, a little bit. That's a start. All right. <laughs> uh, the Prison Arts Foundation was set up uh, as a, uh, a registered trust in, in 1996, and it was involved with the, uh, uh, the Arts Council for the Prison Service, the Probation Board, the Community Relations Council, the Community Arts Forum. And the idea was to use drama in any or arts in any way, shape, or form within the prison or the criminal justice system, and that's what we do. Now, to explain a little bit, there's a there's a, there's a slide in there somewhere. If you go through it, and you'll find that there's a, a grid there on the numbers of people in prison. So if you just dive through till you find that one, because okay. I'll be getting that's it. Because I'll be going through for time here, so uh, I'm conscious that I'm, this, I'm the last gig before lunch, which is a pretty dangerous place to be. <laughs> So I'll move it on as fast as I can. But just to let you know about this prison context, and I'll be using the word um, or the masculine most of the way through because women only make up around about 1.75% uh, of the prison population. And as you can see it there, it's uh, 1,537 at the moment, uh, as of uh, two weeks ago. And if you look at Ash House women there, you'll see that there's less than 50 in there. There are more Northern Irish women in Holloway Prison in London than there are in Northern Ireland. Um, out of all that, 70% uh, of that 1,500 uh, are less than key stage one in literacy. Um, when you look at these three, three prisms, it's really only three prisms, Ash House is in the Young Offenders Centre because there are so few women there throwing them in with the young offenders um, to, to keep them there. Um, when you look at all this, the average age here now has only just come down to 30 years, and that's as long as I've been in Northern Ireland. Uh, it was quite higher, which is not really common in prison stakes. You know, people who are around the world will know, you know, their prisons are, are quite young places, but they're quite high here. Uh, we in Northern Ireland as well, I say we, with license. Um, we in Northern Ireland here are the only place in the world that actually closed two prisons and let everybody out. <laughs> a lot of people close them and move them to somewhere else, but we've closed them and let them out. Anyway, uh, a place like Mangabri is not just one prison, it's nine prisons. It has two separate landings where uh, the people still left over from the paramilitary violence uh, are housed, very separated, a prison hospital. It's a very large remand section, special security units. It has the life of population. It has the reach landing, which is the people who are uh, too sick to go to mental hospitals and the mental hospitals don't want them anyway. So it's about nine different prisons and it's quite a uh, quite a hard place to govern and as you'll see from the Sunday newspapers all the time and uh, uh, well problems there. Um, another thing I'd like to just say, say about McGabry at the moment is that it's it uh, was designed as a place to um, bring people from the cash, the long cash or the maze. It was put and built as a place where uh, the, those engaged in paramilitary activities would, um, get, would get a, a better prison sentence out there. There would be more things that they could involve themselves with uh, in a prison system. And so they had a better education department. They had uh, better other facilities that were going. Most people in prison meet the one person that they did not think that they would meet in prison themselves. Uh, Carlo Gabler and uh, John Brown, two uh, very good uh, novelists and writers in prison, and have been working on it for ages, 
and John Brown, my, my writer in residence in McGillian, um, he, he was talking at a, at a prison conference just recently, and he stood up, and, and I think you'll like this, and I, I loved it as well. He was talking about writing in prison and the importance of it. And he, not, he's not a stand-up comedian or anyway, but he said, consider prison writing, he said. Think about the Bible. If you took out all the prison, prisoners in that book, it'd be a pretty thin read. <laughs> I had never seen it that way. It's kind of nice, you know, because Jesus, Moses, you name them, they're all there, Paul, all the Gospels, all the Epistles, brilliant. And uh, he talked about prison writing in those sort of terms. And it really struck a chord with uh, not only the people going to the conference, but uh, the prisoners who were there he was addressing at that same time. So it's a very important process. Also, it's very important because the traditional things that prisoners do inside prison would be uh, painting and writing, if they can get their hands on <coughs> half the time. But more about that later. Can I have another slide, please? As, as our... Um, as our average age of the prison population comes down, it's my contention that, you know, we do lock up people who generally cannot make sense at their own time. Um, if, if you're thinking about it in these days, a lot of our prison, if they are 70% <laughs> below key stage one illiteracy, book learning and book reading and all that sort of stuff is not their forte. So what do they do with their time? And a lot of people yell and, and scream about the fact that, um, you know, there seems to be coloured televisions in every cell. But that's the prison service's greatest coup. That's the best manager they've ever had. Back in the old days in prison, you know, you used to feed them bread and water and turn the heating off. That just made them all jumpy. Now you feel full of, you know, good fatty foods, turn the heating up, put on 24-hour television, and they all sleep their way through the prison service. It's good management. Great match. And Carlo, Carlo Gabriel would be the person who would say, you know, um, you've got to keep the person's mind muscle going. You've got to keep that working. You know, uh, and the arts, uh, drama, theatre, writing, it keeps those mind muscle going completely. Can I have another slide, please? It doesn't need any comment at all, that one. It is very important. <coughs> In, in the 20 or two years or so working inside prison or prisoner justice setting, you know, it is really quite amazing. And unfortunately, unlike community arts, you know, you get a group together or two communities together and you produce a vase or something like this or a short film or a, or a story or an anthology or something like this and everybody has got a copy of it. But then the Arts Council go away and say, that's brilliant, look at that, there's their copy of it. But no one goes back to that community and monitors it, you know, 19 years down the line to see what's still happening. Because we don't have the funding for that. And this is what this is what happens. We actually make the mind muscle work for those people in prison. And they come from all these backgrounds, and they come from the troubles, and they are part and parcel of all those targeted social needs areas right the way across the problems that have been in the thick of the troubles we've had here. Go another slide, please. And because of the prison context, the, the kind of people that we do have in prison, and I must make a point on this, I was at a rally on Saturday uh, talking about the kind of people in prison. I was at a rally on Saturday by the, uh, organised by the trade unions, you know, for the, uh, the cuts. And there's all these people talking about the bankers going, put them in prison, put them in prison. I'm saying, no, no. I was the only voice saying, no, no I don't want that sort in there. None at all. <laughs> Terrible stuff. <laughs> Social interaction is very important, and especially with this group of people. In the prison context that we have here in Northern Ireland, it is very important. I think we have also, because of the statistics and, and the troubles, we have the highest proportion of lifers. We don't have a very big prison population per capita, but we have the highest population, or we have a very high population of lifers. And one can only lead or speculate that it might be because of that period of the troubles whereby, you know, life seems very cheap. Not from the theatre of witness that we've heard there, those very public and personal stories that we've heard, but that may well be the perception. And we have now currently around about 100 people out of that 1,500 that are on the lifers working their way through. Um, and quite
quite a lot more on remand at the moment. Um, getting people to tell their stories, the soft dramaturgy. <coughs> it's important to get that process going. As, as Taylor would know, then obviously it's what you do with it, then where you go with it. Uh, very important, but you must start to open that dialogue. You must use all the tricks in the book to try and get those stories out there, to open people up. Um, and, and, and one of the main things that I've found in, in doing this kind of work is that, and we, we talked about listening, Cynthia talked about listening, and it's getting people to understand that listening isn't just waiting for their turn to speak. It's really listening, and you, you have to teach people how to listen, because that's quite important as well, or otherwise it just becomes a whole collection of stories and they have no effect at all, or not as much as we should, or they should have. And the role play. And, and again, I'm just making this note here, the role play is quite important uh, for the prison context as we move forward. Okay, can I put on please? I'm sorry. Uh, what I want to say a little bit about this, this is a, it's a personal theory that, that goes along and uh, it's backed up. We have a, a network of, a prison art network of, of people who work in theatre and prisons right across Europe. And uh, we, we've yet to find a, a different way of looking at it. The three stages of uh, the human response to prison is really this doodling, which is the, the almost the moulding a piece of bread uh, to, to, to make bread roses, or the, the writing of a, of a Valentine's Day poem, or something like this. These things are scribbled down, like doodling when you're on the telephone. That is the first stage of, of the drama process, or the reaction, or the process to a person in prison. The second stage we call the drama process, and not to be confused with drama as a part of the theatre. The drama stage is where you interact with somebody else. Uh, let's face it, if you're, um, you, you'll find that you're fairly good at pen and ink drawing or pencil and, and paper drawing, the bloke in the cell next to you will uh, have a little look at what you've done and uh, he'll sort of say, can you do me one? I'll give you two cigarettes. Great jail economy works on, and uh, the fellow that says, how do we get three cigarettes? Nice a bit of paper or a bit of pencil, and we move on. So he then has to find out how to get that bit of paper or those pencils, and that becomes the drama, the negotiating, getting forward, the better. Um, in so doing, he may actually have to uh, interact with teachers. He may have to do a bit of book learning. He may have to learn to read and write. And so we find that the use of arts within the prison, then it's a conduit back into maybe formal education. And the last bit is the most important, the exhibition bit, or the theatre bit. And it's like our theatre of witness here with Taylor was doing, is that notion whereby yeah, when a, a film is being seen or a, or a piece of theatre is, is, is witnessed, um, the person who is doing it, the actor or the actor, actually stands by what they have done in that exhibition stage. And this is very important because <coughs> that means it's not a million miles away from standing by the crime that they did when they went in there. And that process is quite a nice one to move backwards and forwards in. If you positively reinforce the one that they're doing as a theatre of witness, we can actually get them to stand inside somebody else's shoes. We get them to stand inside like restorative justice, the, 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 the perpetrator, the victim, or the person who is um, you know, part of that whole process. So it's a very important process that do link the drama and the exhibition. Can I have another slide, please? So this is the guy, and uh, I many uh, at the Kester Trust, that's why the two pictures are there, uh, and he was just so pleased that his painting had won this particular award, and he was just over the moon. And as I said, the exhibition stage, there was a self-esteem raising event and he was just so chuffed. He'd never done anything like that in his life before, you know. And uh, so I thought I'd just, just throw that in just to show the, the, the end result of that. Another slide, please. <coughs> There's another fellow too, just, it just on, on the way of it, that I met at this particular ward. And whilst Northern Ireland bats above its weight and gets a lot, this particular fellow interests me, a motorcyclist, and he actually keeps on going out and stealing bikes and then coming into prison so to make these things. And what he got up on the wall is prison soap. And prison soap that 
Well, you, you, you can't use it to actually lather with at all. So he carves in it. He carves pictures of bikes and motors, sorry, bikes, uh, motor cars, and all these sort of strange things. And he's so proud. He's a big fella. That's his mum sitting next to him. They're standing next to him. She's very proud of him as well. So this is the exhibition stage. It's absolutely brilliant. All right, another slide, please. The drama toolbox. You all are uh, quite. Well, I hope most of you are. Uh, are au okay fait with all that. The applied drama, we've talked about, people have mentioned it, you know, the, the likes of the playback theatre, the forum theatre, the techniques of Augusta Boal, and all these sorts of things. Drama therapy, very important, not much used in Northern Irish prisons. It's always important to know that, to, to, to know that when you're using drama therapy, it's, I always think about it, you know, as, as letting the monkeys out of the box. You've got to be sure that you've got someone to put the monkeys back in the box when you're finished. We animators, we people who go, amateurs, we go into prisons. We've got to make sure that there's somebody there that can actually look after them at the end of it. I mean, the Theatre of Witness, as Taylor will probably know, it will produce quite uh, amazing reactions in an audience. It's, it's important to know what to do with those reactions, how to look after that sort of stuff, how to support the people who are moved, <coughs> as I was sitting here, and there might be more people who are even more moved than that, to, 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 to help them get through what they've done. It's most important. So the theatre is also very important to standing by in the exhibition of it. Come on the last slide, please. Just want a quick one as I'm finishing up here. It's sort of self-explanatory. Michael Diamond, uh, he, uh, about 91 when I first started in the prisons, he actually couldn't read and write. There was a, uh, a piece, uh, a creative writing seminar. Um, he was in the table. Uh, President Clinton's first inauguration, and so I said to him, I said to the group, all right, let's do something on America. And uh, five of them said, yes, we'll do it. Uh, Michael Diamond said, I can't write, but I'll do something in my head. Um, we went to the table, we, we asked what they'd written. Uh, his piece I committed to memory because it went like this. For a bloke who didn't write, composed it in his head. He said, um, the American, American culture like an oil slick tame and change the face of our national game. Because now it's with baseball bats that we break the knees in Divis Flats. <laughs> <laughs> that was his offering. Brilliant, I thought. Now, 19 years later, having now um, learned to play guitar and uh, writing, and he's written two plays, and uh, that's where it all comes from, you know. And uh, so he turned to me in the land when his play was being produced and sort of said, he said, crime doesn't pay. But he learned inside, and he learned through this entire process, this formal education process within the prison. Um, I'd like to just give a little bit of perspective. Thank you very much. <laughs>